you're listening to The Primal Happiness Show, a podcast dedicated to helping you thrive in this crazy modern world. Every Tuesday, we explore the nature of how our minds really work, what exactly the human animal requires to thrive, and how we can live happier and more fulfilling lives. If you're new here and haven't yet taken our free class, then there's no better place to get a jump start on reclaiming your primal happiness. It's where we'll guide you step-by-step through our antidote to today's modern world. Simply head on over to primalhappiness.co slash antidote to get the free class and discover how to thrive without having to move to a planet that's not so crazy as ours. But now, your host, Leanne brooks Tyler. Hello, my beautiful people. A huge warm welcome back to the show. In today's crazy modern world, men and women are living shallow, disconnected and unfulfilling lives. So we created the path for those who are ready to reclaim their wildness and actualize their deepest gifts. The next way you can join us and walk that path is via Waking the Wild Masculine and Waking the Wild Feminine coming this September, the first in well over a year. We are so, so delighted to be opening these again. They are potent circles to support you in discovering your soul path, expressing your heart's truth and growing into sovereignty, all whilst being fully seen and held by a circle of your fellow men or women. It is incredibly powerful, activating magic. Go along to primalhappiness.co slash WTWF for Wake the Wild Feminine or primalhappiness.co slash WTWM for Waking the Wild Masculine to discover more and to register your interest. The spaces are intentionally limited to create the most intimate and powerful experience and they tend to fill up fast. So if you are feeling it's for you, take action now to be sure of your place once they open for enrollment soon. And now into this week's show. It's with Dr. David Luke, and I am very excited to share this one with you. David is Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Greenwich, UK, where he has been teaching an undergraduate course on the psychology of exceptional human experience since 2009. He's also Honorary Senior Lecturer at the Centre for Psychedelic Research, Imperial College London, and Lecturer on the MSc Consciousness, Spirituality and Transpersonal Psychology for ALF Trust and Liverpool John Moores University. When he is not running clinical drug trials with LSD, conducting DMT field experiments, or observing apparent weather control with Mexican shamans, he directs the Ecology, Cosmos and Consciousness Salon at the Institute of Ecotechnics London and is co-founder and the director of Breaking Convention International Conference on Psychedelic Consciousness. He has studied techniques of consciousness alteration from South America to India from the perspective of scientists and shamans. He lives on the edge of Sussex in the UK. In this show, we spoke about how we can use altered states of consciousness to receive ideas, solutions to problems and rich guidance for life. How those states are known and valued across the world and throughout time. And it's only in modern culture that we've lost that knowledge. And finally, how they are so much more accessible than you might think. There is no need to fly across the world to take plant medicine, unless that is really what you want to do. There are other ways that you could do in your own home right now. Ah, <sighs> this is a gorgeously rich episode. I'm really, really glad to share it with you. Let's dive in. Hello, David. Welcome to the show. Hello, Leanne. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. I'm uh, so excited about this. Just in the uh, conversation we were just having just now, I was thinking there's so many um, different parts of this conversation that we could be having. And, uh, the one we've picked is super juicy, but I'm actually already feeling already. I kind of probably were going to want to have you to come back <laughs> and talk about all of this even more. Cause it, it's so juicy. So juicy. That's wonderful. We haven't even started yet. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I agree. I'll come back. so 
I would love to just start with understanding what led you into, uh, I think you've described almost quite a uh, suicidal line of work. <laughs> you could put it. What on earth has led you here? How, how has this become a passion of yours? So what well, the, the brief story on how I committed double career Harry Carey. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, I mean, uh, as a teenager, actually in the early days of school, I, I was always actually skiving off school. And, but I would take myself to the secondhand bookshops and I would just read all the kind of left field esoteric stuff and all the left field science. And so I kind of educated myself, really. And I ultimately got thrown out of school. But then... Um, and, you know, kind of experimented with my brain like a neurochemistry experimental kit, really, <laughs> and uh, in various ways. And that inspired me to go away and study and, and go and study psychology. So I went to university late, a little bit later in life and did a psychology degree, hoping to try and understand, you know, altered states and the psychedelic experience and a lot of the kind of parapsychological phenomena I've become very interested in and was mm. woefully disappointed, of course, in what you learn on a standard psychology degree. And so I was kind of forced to then continue with my studies, the doctorate level, just to try and understand this stuff, really. And, and then ended up injecting what I thought was missing back into the academy. Um, so, I mean, I don't know how successful I've been in doing that, but I somehow miraculously still have a job even though I've been researching these, not just one taboo area like parapsychology, but, you know, psychedelics and altered states as well, which has now actually become very respectable, although parapsychology mm. still remains very taboo. Yeah, yeah, very much so. It's, um, it's really interesting what you said there, that you actually chose to study psychology, but already with this sense of where you really wanted to go but it's, it's so fascinating and we're going to obviously get into this more later in the conversation but that the stuff that you were really interested in is missing from our modern view of kind of like how we create our experience how our minds works what creates this work like isn't it fascinating I mean it's no wonder it's kind of like it's it's the very reason it's missing is the very reason we're where we are, you could say. But isn't that fascinating that that isn't like something as important as altered states of consciousness isn't like deeply embedded in our understanding of psychology? Yeah, very much so. I mean, th there are obviously kind of pioneers out there who've been kind of diligently studying this stuff for, you know, over the last 150 years, we can find them. But that it, you, you can't find it anywhere in a psychology mm. curriculum, you know. It's, uh, so you've, they, they teach you, I like to think they teach you about all the, the, the kind of stuff in the middle, the ordinary stuff, you know, about kind of group dynamics and social psychology and personality. And then all the things that happen, you know, when things go wrong, like psychopathology or clinical psychology, mental health, mental illness particularly. But they don't teach you anything about all the other stuff on the other mm. end of the spectrum. It's those exceptional experiences which aren't necessarily pathological or you know uh, in any way ab aberrant right or, or, though they mm. may not be so common so we're missing you know you only get a part of the the range of human experience which is yeah I, I like yeah I, like, I think as you say is also part of the problem right you know mm. um, as we're kind of uncovering and finding that by delving into these realms, we're finding new and better treatments for mental health problems, um, which we knew about before, but it's been <laughs> long to so, yeah. yeah, It's changing though, I think it is changing, but it's still somewhat slowly. Mm, yes, very much so. And we were talking also before we started recording about how, how important this is now, how necessary this is. This isn't, it can be seen as though this is the, almost kind of like fantasy, you know, just almost like living in a dream world version of um, science or understanding psychology, but it's actually essential right now. So essential. Um, so yeah, again, I for one are so, so grateful for people like you doing what you do. Like we really need it. Thank you very much. Yeah. I mean, well, luckily, and what's happened in the last 10 or 20 years is a, a certain research interest in, in psychedelics again, which is, which is kind of changing the landscape in, in many different ways. 
uh, whether or not we're, we're just interested in psychedelics or not, but it's, it's making the, the study of altered states and their consequences, you know, it's putting it back on, on the research agenda again. And a lot of that came through with the advent of neuroscience, ironically, you know. So it, actually up until about 20 years ago, consciousness was the dirty word mm. in, in, in the academy, in psychology. You couldn't even talk about consciousness. It was like, oh, no, not that wishy-washy stuff. And now it's become the focus of research in neuroscience. You know, it's obviously about finding the underlying biological brain mechanisms underpinning consciousness, but now consciousness is like the, the agenda really, in, in the object of study. Mm. So things have changed dramatically. And because of that, you know, psychedelics came back in because these are exceptional tools for helping us understand how the brain and consciousness functions ordinarily by giving you these extreme states. You can see what changes in, in people's brains. And also because of the potential clinical uses for them in treating addictions, uh, depression, anxiety, trauma and so on so mm. yeah the landscape has shifted dramatically in the last 20 years yeah interesting time to be alive for sure and um, i was just thinking the kind of irony i suppose in this is so much of what we're talking about here is you know age old understanding like this isn't you know on the one hand it's like yeah this could be described as cutting edge but actually it's also as old as time you know when we look at indigenous cultures throughout the world throughout time they always have this deep understanding and also practices around altering states of consciousness like absolutely you know so embedded in the context this isn't a kind of oh go and go to fly to Peru to go and do an ayahuasca ceremony and then fly back and, you know, to London and carry on doing your job. It's like embedded in their way of life in a way that even when I'm saying this, I know that I can't really understand it because it's, it's so outside of my under, like, way of life. But that's what we see over and over, isn't it? Like this is just part of how humans lived. It wasn't a kind of like side order. It's like embedded in how we live. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's an anthropologist, um, uh, is also a neuroscientist actually, uh, by name Charles Laughlin, and he talked about different cultures, and he's talked about monophasic cultures and polyphasic cultures, i.e. the states of consciousness that they appreciate. So in the West and in the developed world, we're a monophasic mm. culture. We only really value the ordinary, everyday, awake, alert state of consciousness, perhaps a little bit wow. caffeine fueled to make you more productive and yeah. occasionally you maybe just drunk on the weekend as, as a kind mm -hmm. of, you know, time off for good behaviour. Um, whereas in other cultures, indigenous cultures, most indigenous cultures around the world value and appreciate a variety of states of consciousness. In fact, they tend to value the altered states of consciousness more so than, yes. you know, the ordinary everyday waking state. And that's what he called polyphasic culture. So oh, somehow we've got to the point where we, we just rigidly stuck in this kind of, oh, you can only be sober and alert and awake. Uh, and, and in fact, sleeping and dreaming doesn't even kind of enter into <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I love that way of uh, speaking about it. I've not heard of that before. That's, that's just Fabulous. Really love that. Yeah, it's so interesting. Like you say, even the, um, let's say, fairly accessible other states of consciousness, like sleep and dreaming, are so, so dismissed again, that it's like, you know, even the ones that even in our modern lives, we do have access to and do experience, actually, but because of the way we hold it, we're not really deeply experiencing it. And um, it's, that again is so on its own, like just the dream state is so valued in indigenous cultures, most, I guess, in a way that we don't in, in our modern world. I was just thinking of the book um, Original Wisdom. Um, I don't know if you've come across that. It's, it's based on an indigenous um, indigenous people in Malaysia, I think. It's a fabulous book. It really, really gorgeous book. And um 
this anthropologist sort of follows this band of people around, just like, you know, immersed himself in their way of life and uh, writing about it. And so much about is their dreams. And they have this tradition where they sleep together in kind of small groups together and then wake up. And the first thing they do is they all share their dream that night. And they'll like weave it in together, you know, like they'll, they'll take such deep meaning from which they'll live their lives, you know, seen as a priority, not just a kind of night, like we, we ridicule it in today's world, like, you know, keeping a dream diary, but like for them, it was like held as like, not even just sacred, but like, of course you would do that. How would you not honor your dreams? Like this, like incredible wisdom. Very much so. So I wasn't aware of that particular Ma- Malaysian culture, but I mean, I'm more au fait with your uh, Central and South American cultures. And th- there is lots of examples of that there. You know, the schwa, for instance, they actually get up at 4 a.m. They do the same thing. They sleep communally. They'll wake up in 4 a.m. and uh, share their dreams, uh, which is, you know, every day. It's, it's kind of core to what they do. And everybody's dream is just as important, be, be they two years old or 102 years old. Mm. And they'll base all their important life decisions for the day on, on the dreams of the night. If somebody has an auspicious dream that way, well, maybe we should move camp because of that and go further into the forest there or something like that. Wow. So, yes, we find that all over the world, not just in, mm. in Asia, but everywhere in indigenous cultures. Yeah, that doesn't. I suspect that was the case. It was just that's the first time I've had it really, you know, clearly like outlined as a practice uh, that I knew of. Um, oh, how wonderful! So, what would you, when we're talking about this idea of there being multiple states of consciousness? Um, I know what I'm about to ask you is in some ways like an impossible question. <laughs> I'm evil like that, <laughs> but. What's your own, um, I guess, sense of like, what are we talking about when we're talking about altered states of consciousness? What are those states of consciousness? Uh, you mean, how do we define them or, or what, what are the possible states we can get into? <laughs> yeah, as in, I guess, you know, the very fact that we've got that kind of, you, you described in, in our kind of Western culture with this like, you know, waking state that we kind of you know play around the edges with caffeine and alcohol and stuff but uh, in general it's kind of one state when we're talking about these other states like where are they what are we accessing what becomes available so it's, it's quite a general question but it's more just wanting to understand like from your understanding like what are these states well i don't think though certainly i don't understand them fully and i've been kind of studying them for decades and and they have been much kind of maligned and ignored so we don't really fully understand them. And I think, you know, I think it's, there's a kind of certain amount of arrogance to assume that we understand consciousness at all. We don't. Completely. But Hence we, me saying it is an impossible question. Yeah, so <laughs> but, but, those, yeah. but yeah. I'll give you my opinion for now. And, and that would be that uh, they, they, well, it's, what we're looking, finding from the neurological perspective is we find that your brain is obviously operating in a very different way. And, there's, instead of the usual, there's, there's some very kind of constrained and confined thought processes or patterns of functional activity in the brain ordinarily, but in these altered states such as dreams or meditation or psychedelics, that, that, that ordering in the brain kind of breaks down and we have this kind of slightly anarchic state where different parts of your brain region are all communicating with each other. And so this act opens up access to uh, all kinds of extraordinary phenomena. So, you know, you have a lot of associative thinking of these kind of fresh novel ideas, mythological thinking, you know, connection with a, what we might call the unconscious mind. So that, that all of these um, disparate parts of the brain and different thoughts and ideas are all kind of emancipated and, and liberated and allowed access to, which you can do, you know, every night through dreams. Uh, and that gives states of, you know, it gives rise to things like synesthesia, where we have, we start to have uh, a melding of our sensory system. So you may suddenly see sounds or taste shapes. Uh, we may remember and have access to very deep and buried memories, you know, even childhood traumas, which is obviously really useful and important for, you know, clinical therapeutic work and, and, you know, dealing with depression and trauma and things like that. 
I mean, hence why Freud and Jung, you know, very much valued dreams mm. as a means of accessing the unconscious. But now we have a whole range of different ways of, of accessing it. Um, they change our perceptions and things. You know, they're really useful for creativity and, and creative problem solving uh, because they give us so many fresh perspectives on things and even just our everyday you know, uh, interpersonal lives, you know, they, they can give us a fresh perspective on where we are in our relationships or, mm. you know, it's really good advice, I think, just to sleep on something. And I, I try and try and <laughs> engender that a lot. Like, oh, I've got a bit of a problem. Okay, I'll just ignore it and I'll, I'll think about it tomorrow, you know. It sounds like a bit escapist or, you know, just a way of ducking out of things, but it, you really do get mm. a different perspective on it when you've, you've slept on something. So there's a whole range of access to, I mean, these are just some of the more ordinary things. And then, of course, when we delve into altered states on a little deeper level, then they, they start opening up access to things like experiences of telepathy or having an out-of-body experience or having a spiritual or mystical kind of experiences, you know, accessing the divine, uh, communicating with... Uh, dead relatives or, uh, you know, communicating with your ancestors or um, seeing the world from the perspective of other species. You know, there, there's a whole range of what we call transpersonal experiences that suddenly open up as well when we go into these altered states. Um, what's actually happening, you know, uh, how do we understand and explain that? Well, we've still got a long way to go, I think. But, you know, th this is the kind of range of experiences we can expect mm. wow when it's it just hit me and you how how sad and how unwise it is for us as a culture to have just dismissed this as part of our lives it just really it's really just hit me all over again and of course when we look at people who have um had a big impact on the world I'd say, in general, they have understood this to one one extent or other. You know, when we look at people who, you know, whether they've had big success in business or in the sciences, often they will have had practices of these kinds, as in practices of, that allow them to access other states of consciousness in their lives. Would you Would you agree that's the case? Yeah, I think to some extent, I think there's a good argument for that. I mean, it hasn't really been too thoroughly explored. I mean, people like, Chintzi I can't pronounce his name, is the expert. He's the kind of guy who came up with the concept of flow states, you know, mm. and how important they are for creativity. But we have, you know, numerous examples historically of uh, innovations and discoveries and breakthroughs leading to Nobel Prizes and things like that that have came through altered states, be it through dreams or through psychic mm. it may be. And the, to give you one good example is to think where we are now currently with our state of understanding in, in genetics, which is a really, you know, it's an extraordinary field of molecular biological discovery. There's a few really key points that happened that needed to happen to get us where we are now. And the first one was, you know, understanding the relationship between different chemicals and, uh, and elements. And, you know, Mendeleev, who discovered the periodic table, He'd been studying the chemistry of all these different elements, but he couldn't, he knew there was a pattern to it, but he couldn't quite work it out. And then he, he, he woke up from a dream having fully formed the whole periodic table that we now wow. use. It was completely accurate, except for one element was in the wrong place. You know, fast forward from him, then uh, August Kukule was working on the structure of uh, the benzene ring. The benzene ring is, is six carbon atoms, uh, which is the basis of all organic chemistry, you know, so all kind of anything to do with molecular, uh, biological chemistry. And he could work out the structure of it. And then it, again, it came to him in a dream that it was, it, it was in this kind of uh, circular hexagonal shape because he saw a snake eating its own tail. And he realized, aha, yeah, that's the structure of the, these six carbon atoms. It's not linear, it's, it's circular. So that gave rise to, you know, uh, organic chemistry, which then... Uh, we see this benzene shape in DNA even. And in fact, you know, Francis Crick discovered the, the DNA double helix structure was also said to be under the influence of LSD at the time. And then fast forward to Carrie Mullis, 
uh, who also won a Nobel Prize for biochemistry, he discovered what we call PCR, polymerase chain reaction, which is where you can take a single strand of DNA and replicate it, uh, and, and therefore you, you can map genes and genomes and forensic genetics and genetic analysis, even, even the kind of DNA, the tests we use for identifying viruses like COVID use PCR. So he won a Nobel Prize for this. And then after he got his Nobel Prize, he said, well, yeah, basically I'd taken loads of LSD and I was able to fly alongside the strands of the DNA structure at a molecular level and, and see what was going on. So oh, I yeah, love that. Was, I love <laughs> everything for that, right? <laughs> oh my goodness. And yet... It's like, despite that, we somehow then go back, I suppose it's just how, how um, you know, how human perception works. It's like, whilst knowing those those things that are so, we still go back to like, no, all to say it's a conscious to have no benefit. Why on earth would we take notice of our dreams? It's just like mind boggling, really, isn't it? But what we can, how we can convince ourselves so thoroughly as a culture that this has no value. Um, something just... Um, occurred to me uh, to ask you that relates to um, uh, speaking to Dean Radin, a friend of yours, um, recently about his studies in parapsychology. And I was thinking it's um, what he's, I don't know if you'd agree with this. I'm just trying to look at it through the lens of what we're talking about here. I think what he's talking about or what he's, his works around is um, I guess commonalities that are true in terms of like human capabilities that are just true actually, even from our kind of everyday state of consciousness. And then it feels as though your work is kind of potentially doing similar studies, but through Mm -hmm. the lens of like, but then what come becomes possible when we open up, if we sort of see that his works through that kind of aperture of like, ordinary consciousness what if you open the aperture up and then do that what becomes available and I, I remember uh, you talked about I think it was in your TED talk about the work that you'd done about kind of um watch uh, films you know like predicting what the film was that was going to get picked I've done a terrible job explaining that but I think you know no, what you're I mean. right. <laughs> yeah mm. and um I just thinking it's so interesting that even without altering your state of consciousness what dean's work is showing is like these kind of capabilities are actually like you know inherently there for humans and then what you're showing is what could look like almost like fake states of consciousness as in your take like consuming something but the fact is these are actually states of consciousness that are available to us anyway within the ordinary human range if again we were living in more natural ways you know we talked about before we started recording you know whether that be drumming dreaming um sex there's all sorts of ways that are actually just inherently normal to humans that allows us to access these states of consciousness so i'm not sure where my question's going but it just hit me that like it's so interesting that what he's studying is, is ultimately, I guess, we're pointing to the same thing, but you, what you're doing is kind of like widening the aperture and saying, like, what's possible through this? So I, given I've just gestured really terribly to the studies you've done, <laughs> could you just share with listeners <laughs> something that might make this a little bit clearer than I've just made it? <laughs> no, no, uh, no problem. Uh, I, think you, I think you did a really good job. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you're right. It's, it's so just to kind of recap a little bit on what you're saying is, is that... Feel free. I didn't do a good job. <laughs> no, 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 no. Is, is that, you know, for instance, you know, the experiences people have in, in altered states have always classically been just labelled hallucination. So, you know, there's hallucination. Mm. It's kind of like wastebasket term. Yes. It's like if, if it's not an ordinary, everyday, consensus reality, objective, like, perception, uh, then it's an hallucination. And, and therefore, we don't have to bother trying to understand it yeah. and we can just assign it's it to waste mm. yeah it's nonsense or possibly even pathological you know you're probably maybe teetering on delusion and madness right and so that we can put psychedelic experiences dreams you know hypnosis all this kind of stuff we can just dump it over there and we don't have to deal with it you know and so consequently you know things like psychedelic experiences or dreams get written off and what and what is dean's doing indeed is is looking at perceptual abilities which we may not actually be aware of because they, they tend to be very subtle right so yes. but they, mm-hmm. they are very much there 
uh, when we take them into the laboratory, we need quite a few people to do it. To come. But when you see the trends appearing across a few people, you realise, OK, this is a genuine effect, right? It's, it's beyond what we'd expect by chance. Yeah. But it's subtle enough that you'd, you might not, you might miss it ordinarily, or you could just easily dis- discount it. Yes. Like, oh, that's mm-hmm. a coincidence, or that was just lucky, you know. Uh, there's some ordinary everyday experiences that people have, like telephone telepathy. You know, you, you get that sense where you ha- you're just thinking about somebody you haven't thought about in years, and then suddenly the phone rings and they've called you out of the blue, and you're like, I was just thinking about you. That's a very common experience. Mm. Or, or people get in the sense that, you know, they're being stared, or they get the kind of prickly feeling on the back of their neck and turn around, there's somebody across the other side of the street behind them staring at them, or likewise, if you're, you happen to be in in the car and you, you're just looking at somebody further down the street and they suddenly stop and turn around, you know. So these are kind of everyday experiences which you might pass off. So what Dean's research and other parapsychologists has found is that these, these things tend to occur, they're, they're genuine, but they're, they're quite subtle effects and they tend to happen below our, our level of awareness often. So, so you can tap into them best like through Dean's research by looking at the body, you know, looking at people's physiological responses, mm. their physiological arousal uh, in, in these precognition experiments where you, you, you see what their body's doing when you show them uh, a, a, a shocking image suddenly. Uh, what's their body doing just prior to that? Oh. And you'll see that their body responds before they even see the image, right? Uh, but you're not consciously aware of that. Mm-hmm. So what I think psychedelics and other altered states are doing is they, they give you access to this unconscious material and they make you more sensitive to this, this information stream uh, in, in that you, you make the, the unconscious, you bring it into the conscious mind and, and so you're more readily able to access this information, you know, that you're able, more able to have these these uh, telepathic or precognitive experiences. And that's something we find, you know, people in altered states tend to report far more experiences of telepathy or clairvoyance. And that if we look at people's reports of, oh, I had an experience of telepathy or, or clairvoyance or precognition, is it, they're primarily in altered states when they report them. But it, mm. yes, you're right. It, it's something we, we are always have access to. It's just that our ordinary state of consciousness, we, we may easily miss that. And so altered states will tune you into that a bit easier, I think. Mm. So you're yeah, absolutely wonderful. right. Mm. And in my own, I think it's a bit about my own experiments. No, no, I was about to say that. (laughs) (laughs) Play your own trumpet here, please. (laughs) But in my own experiments, I mean, they've been very much inspired by Dean's research and and, and, uh, other colleagues uh, in that there's quite a kind of standard setup of precognition experiments whereby the idea would be that you're about to see four video clips, uh, one minute video clips each, and uh, that you, you've never seen before. That Well, you may have seen them in, in the films they come from, but you don't know what's coming, basically. It could be anything. And they're all kind of designed to be different from each other. Um, and then you through some process, whatever it may be, of trying to, before you see the clips, you, you, you know, you look into your mind's eye and you try and see what, what the target might be. Uh, and then you look at the four clips and you, you say which one of the, of the, the four images uh, or the four videos was most like your, your mental imagery. And then the computer runs a random number generator and selects one of them as being the target. So it's like the computer decides in the future mm. which one of these four video clips is the actual target. And your task is to try and predict that through the use of your mental imagery. And, and that mental imagery could be induced through an altered state. So I've done this research with dreams. I've, I've done it with various psychedelic agents as well. And that was what I was talking about in my TED talk. And of course, we find that, yes, actually people tend to select and identify the target far more than we would expect by chance, you know, mm. when they use these altered states to try and get the mental imagery of the, the future future event. Um, so, you know, you'd expect to get the, the target right 25% of the time because it's there's four different images, it's one in four, and we find that they get the target right about 40% of the time. So mm. it's, like, it's not like you're right all the time. It's not like a, you're, you're, you suddenly become super psychic and 
can perfectly intuitive. Yeah. No, but yeah. that's pretty impressive, actually. Um, yeah, Absolutely, it's, I think so. it's not subtle. In comparison, what would be the equivalent um, percentage in, for example, Dean's studies? If chance is 25% and yours was 40%, what would that be in uh, the work he's done, for example, if there is a nice that's sort of roughly good comparison we had a slightly different setup but uh so for instance the gansfeld uh experiments they get it consistently get around 33 percent you mm. know it's like about you're getting it right a third of the time instead of a fourth of the time right yeah Which is, you know, better than chance his experiments are a little bit different i couldn't tell you off the top of my head but when you use the physiological ones did he talk about those the presentiment mm. experiments where you yeah. just want the body's arousal they reliably get uh, it's it's not on a kind of hit or miss basis generally. Oh, it is actually in a way, but it's more like they look at the level of physiological arousal for for the arousing images and for the calm images, and they find this kind of big difference basically before they actually see the images. So it's, you can't really compare it in the same way, um, apart from statistically. But I'm not going to go into that. But um, a comparable, I would say, if you're looking at the body or what happens in an old state if you ask a person to directly do it in a just ordinary off the bat state of consciousness the effects are looked lower they're still there but you have to test more and more people to to, to kind of detect the effect because it's, yes. it's just hard to detect if you ask a person in a sober state just consciously to do it unless they're mm. very gifted right yes of course that's natural. true too yeah there are that that's uh something that uh, Dean and I touched on that generally these studies are done on kind of just, you know, everyday people off the street, as it were. And of course, within a population, there are going to be people who do just do have a greater capacity for this. Um, yeah. Oh my God. The whole thing is so, so exciting. Yeah. I just <laughs> I love this conversation. The extraordinary thing is, yes, you can look at just anybody and, and if you get enough people mm -hmm. and, and do your experiments, you get these results. It's like, we all have this capacity, right? Mm. Which is yeah. just, yeah, I find, oh, just amazing, amazing that um, it's taken this long for us to get to the point where, I mean, even now it's clearly not uh, universally accepted, but, you know, hopefully that's not going to be too much longer. You know, again, with, with the work that you and uh, people in, in your line of work are doing, I don't think it's going to be that long before we do have to accept this as being like, yeah, that's how humans work. That's how it is. Yeah, I think we're moving in that direction. I think the recent renaissance and interest in psychedelic research, you know, the genies come out the bottle, the corks come out the mm. bottle, because, you know, neuroscientists and all kinds of scientists are now exploring these states, like, openly and earnestly, and they're discovering, hey, guess what? You know, in the, in the clinical research, where they're finding extraordinary results, you know, uh, dealing with people's depression and trauma and anxiety and so on, they're finding, you know, very high success rates with these treatments. However, it's those people who have a mystical experience during their psychedelic clinical session that are the ones who have the best outcomes. So, you know, you've got something here that was previously either maligned, ignored, uh, pathologized or demonized, you know, the mystical experience is like, oh no, not that stuff, you know, it's like, uh, is, is what's showing to be important in people's you know overcoming depression or anxiety mm. and so uh you know what was once the madness is now the medicine and, and so these these extraordinary experiences these transpersonal parapsychological experiences are now beginning to be take, taken seriously as having benefit right they're, they're kind of ind indicating that we shouldn't just ignore them and demonize them they, they, they are actually part of our a spectrum of human behavior and and they have potentially massive benefits right if we if we were to understand them and and just embrace them uh mm. which is which is great and so it's it's hopefully we won't backpedal into some kind of spanish inquisition again and uh, mm. this will this will be you know the way we move forward uh so I, I really feel so yeah what what just occurred to me is uh something you said before we started recording which is like yeah within this there are you know undeniably you know there's 
you know, dangers and delusion and that kind of thing. But I was thinking as you're talking then, it's like, yeah, as with everything, there's shadow. Um, but when we're pushing the entire thing into shadow, we don't get to then be in relationship to any of it in any useful way. Whereas I think the more we can just illuminate the whole thing, like, yes, there are parts that we need to be aware of and be careful of. And there's all this gorgeous stuff that we can really benefit from, but we can only do that when we're willing to kind of look at it. Absolutely. Yeah. You, yeah. You hit the nail on the head there. Definitely. Yeah. Mm. Like baby in the bathwater kind of thing. Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Very much so. So we're almost out of time and uh yeah i was quite right at the beginning of the show like i really need to you to come back because there's so much more i want to ask you but uh to finish um up on this episode we've we've touched on a few few ways of accessing these altered states of consciousness as we've been talking but i would just love to hear what's your sense of this? if someone's listening and this is kind of you know fairly new to them as an exploration i mean generally you know, our listeners are a very, you know, smart, conscious bunch. So I don't think it's going to be brand new to them, but what would be ways that they could perhaps, you know, take those deeper steps on this path that aren't going to be, you know, jumping straight into the, you know, the far <laughs> end of it, but what would be some nice, like gentle steps in this direction? Yeah. I'm not recommending that anybody necessarily has to jump on a plane to Peru and go and do an ayahuasca ceremony. Far from it. You know, I mean, that, that is like, one avenue and i think i think people are drawn to that as i said before you know that because of then there's a sense of disconnection with mm -hmm. 21st century western civilized living in that you know people feel so disconnected they feel the requirement to go and do that but we could connect with ourselves and with nature and with some kind of spiritual divine sphere more easily and more readily every day if we connect with our dreams you know if we if we take time to go and spend time out in nature uh if we take up some meditation or yoga or or drumming or dancing or all of these these, these methods as, as you're probably aware you know can fully give us access to to the same states that we get into with psychedelics perhaps less intensely in some states in some cases but not always you know you the, the research I'm doing mapping different altered states is that they all can induce mystical mm. experiences. I mean, you're more like that one with a very high dose of magic dreams, of course, but they, they all give you access to these same spaces. And so it's, it, there's value in, first of all, just paying attention to your dreams, keeping a dream diary, you know, and the more you, you pay attention to the dreams, the more you will discover and the more uh, interesting and mythological and, cosmological and divinatory they become so there's many many ways to to get to the top of the mountain and and uh, just begin taking some steps in that direction really mm, oh, i love that and i can't uh, agree with you enough when it comes to dreams it's something i've paid particular attention to i'd say in the last maybe three years to the point, as you've described, like the more we are consciously in relationship to our dreams, like the more they give back, it becomes a relationship where it's like much more of a conversation where you can make sense of it. And the, the actions I've taken that have come directly through something that was appeared to me in a dream have been some of the most profound, um, you know, whether it be relationships or choices, paths that I've, I've stepped onto, like some of the most profound, like the most powerful. Um, and they literally came from, if I track back, like, why did I think of that? And it was revealed to me in a dream. But like nearly yeah. everything that I've done, that have been like big, profound things in my life over the last few years have come from a dream. Like, which yeah <laughs> likewise actually and having explored so many different old states to varying depths you know it's still dreams have also been always my most insightful as well you know they're, they're, they're very they're, it's it's a much forgotten and it's free you know pretty much everybody gets to dream and we, we do it every night as well so it's, it's a lot to to discover isn't there uh, yeah so very much so and asleep so mm. <laughs> actually on that note i'll, I'll say this because as someone that's always dreamed, uh, seemed to dream very easily and remember them, I did a course recently and realized like, oh yeah, and that's not the same experience for everyone. Some people find it really frustrating that they can't remember their dreams. And 
what I've seen is that the more, again, the more willing we are to be in conscious relationship to like, even to just sort of set the intention before we go to sleep, um, I want to have, you know, really, um, you know, helpful dreams to be given guidance. And then as soon as we wake up, right, record anything, even if it's just tiny little threads, like that grows, that grows. So if you're listening to this and thinking, well, great, it's easy for you and you're having these like amazing dreams, mm-hmm. remember them, like just to even set the intention, like that will happen. It just may take a little bit longer. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's about, as it takes a little bit of trading, but I, I think anybody within a couple of weeks, I say anybody with a small asterisk, kind of, <laughs> Caveat, um, you can, you can fully remember and start accessing some amazing spaces. There are a few people who may not have any visual phenomena in their dreams. Uh, and if you've had a stroke or if you have a fantasia, but the vast majority of people can. So, yeah. Mm. Really. Yeah. Well, um, I really don't want to end this, but we're going to have to. <laughs> Where can listeners find out about you and your amazing work? Uh, well, I have a number of books uh, which are available from any disreputable online bookseller like Amazon. Um, most of, my, well, a lot of it's kind of collections of essays from other writers, but one is uh, Other Worlds, which is my uh, all my own writing. I did it all by myself. <laughs> and uh, I've got a, if you look up uh, an academia.edu, there's a list where academics post up all their papers. All my papers are on there. Uh, it gives you links to all of them. And uh, if people wanted to study it a bit more in depth, I'm also just about to start running a one-year professional certificate course, which is open to anybody um, on psychedelics, altered states, and transpersonal psychology. And that's with the Aleph Trust. If you look up Aleph Trust, A-L-E-F Trust on online and um it starts in february and it's a one-year online course wonderful thank you yeah that that sounds fantastic well thank you so much this has been such a pleasure for me personally i'm sure listeners are going to find the same so thank you and you thank you so much liana and please do keep on what you're doing it's great Oh, wow. What an incredible episode. (laughs) I love that. Such rich wisdom. Here are my top takeaways. It is your birthright to be polyphasic and you can reach all two states of consciousness in so many ways, including hypnotic trance, psychedelics, plant medicines, drumming, dreams and dance. These are available to you, at least some of them, right now, and you can do them. You, They are safe for you. They are available to you. Um, yeah, please, please step into something that you were designed for and was designed for you. These states provide an extremely valuable and yet much misunderstood in modern culture portal to receiving new ideas, solutions, and healing. They've been understood as valuable throughout history and across the world until fairly recently. And even then, by some of the greatest thinkers and creators in the last century. It really is the secret source behind some of the most incredible things that humans have done. You can use your dreams as a powerful state of consciousness by setting the intention for revelatory dreams writing them down every morning, and then noticing the symbols and patterns that are showing up for you. The longer you do this, the more you'll notice what they're providing for you. If you'd like to get notes and links for everything we spoke about this week, hop on over to the show notes and they're at primalhappiness.co slash episode 318. And if you are feeling the call to either Waking the World Masculine or Waking the World Feminine, then go along to primalhappiness.co slash WTWF or primalhappiness.co slash WTWM to register your interest. As I said earlier, the spaces are intentionally limited to create the most intimate and powerful experience. And they do tend to fill up fast. So if you are feeling it's for you, take action now and then you will be sure to get your place as soon as we open for enrolment. You will be one of the first to know. 
If you don't want to miss out next week's episode, head on over to Apple Podcasts, Stitcher or your Android or iOS app of choice and hit that subscribe button. That way you'll get each episode delivered straight to your device as soon as it's released. Thank you so much for listening. You've been wonderful. Catch you again next Tuesday.